It is great to see you here this morning. It really is. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, it's great to see you here this morning. Hey, uh, I know there's a little bit of uh, some rain outside. I love it when it rains. It always makes me think of, of I just love the visual of God's his grace and his mercy raining down, right? Um, we're going to begin by singing uh, just to encourage our souls and remind us of what we have in Christ. We're going to sing this wonderful old hymn, Victory in Jesus. So if you would stand with us and let's just uh, praise the Lord for the victory we have because of Christ. Heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning, and I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory! Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me there, I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory. cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory Sweet day, I sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me there, I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me. To victory, we need the cleansing flood. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love. me to victory beneath the cleansing Hey, before you see this morning, find a good dozen or so and welcome each other by greeting each other this morning. As soon as Donna sits down, we can start. <laughs> All right. Uh, this Sunday, the, in this week, nominations are open for elders, uh, deacons, and deaconesses, and they close next Sunday. So if you've got somebody in mind you want to nominate, let Tyson know, or the office know, or me know, 
and uh, we'll get them to the vetting committee and uh, then we'll proceed with uh, on to the business meeting in November where we'll vote. Uh, communion potluck is uh, next Sunday for the monthly uh, potluck and so there's a sign up out there uh, put down on there what you're going to bring and, uh, and uh, it's always a good time and so stay after after church plan on going to lunch uh, and staying here after after church and having a potluck uh, Thanksgiving baskets don't forget to uh, bring the canned food non-perishable stuff and put it under the bench out there under the table and uh, so we can bless the folks uh, here in the Winton area like we did last year it was very very appreciated um, Alpha Pregnancy Help Center needs uh, volunteers uh, it's a nonprofit that serves the community with life affirming solutions related to pregnancy parenting and relationships uh, there's a bulletin out on the table out there saying what they need and it is a wonderful organization uh, youth group kickoff if you're in junior high or high school, join us here at the church Tuesday, October the 4th, 6 to 8 p.m. as we kick off this year's youth group. First night will be a great opportunity to fellowship and learn more if you're new to the youth group, and we can't wait to see you there. Christmas with the... Christmas with the... Christmas! Jeez, September ends next week. Good grief. And I've got to sign up for, for, uh, for Medicare next month. <laughs> Jiminy Christmas. Christmas with the kids. All children in kindergarten, sixth grade, are encouraged to attend children's church in the months of October and November to start learning the songs and lines for the cr children's Christmas presentation, which will be on Sunday, November the 27th, during the morning service. Uh, in Children's Church, the, the kids are currently studying about the life of Joseph, and starting in January, we'll be learning more about the life of Moses. Looking for more adults and teens who would like to teach or help in Children's Church. Commitment is for three consecutive weeks, approximately every five months. Uh, pre, 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 please, please pray about possibly helping in Children's Church. And if the Lord is calling you to this ministry, contact Lynn Moline. Uh, just a, a minor nitpick here. I noticed that, that very few people came and said hello to Dr. Bob. We need to rectify that. We need to inundate him with uh, handshakes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and we have one notable historic event today. It is the birthday of the one and only Christy Wolf. So as is, is, is our, 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 our deal here, one, two, three. And just so I don't get in trouble with the folks in the sound booth, remember your comment card in the uh, seat pocket in front of you. If you have anything that you want to tell us, uh, address changes, prayer requests, anything like that, please fill that out. Is there anything else? Oh, that's right, that's right. The Kalers had a grandkid, another one. A little girl, and uh, um, on a uh, on a sad, happy note, if anybody uh, uh, remembers the um, Maynard uh, Maynard, huh? Maynard Moline, uh, he passed away this morning. Um, I just got a text about that. So, what a wonderful man, and uh, he and his wife, and uh, just imagine where he is now. Um, He's a, he's a happy camper right now. So you just get one per shot, one per week. Okay, Glenn Bradford, uh, another 
brother, brother in Christ, is uh, funeral is this coming week, Thursday, in Chowchilla. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the sure and certainty that we have in you that um, um, if, uh, if we, we call you Lord that, um, and, uh, and believe in your forgiveness and the, the, your death on the cross and what it means for us that, that we will be with you forever. And uh, I thank you for that, for, uh, for Dave Moline and for uh, Glenn Bradford, um, just wonderful, wonderful people that ran the race and finished the race. And uh, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for the new life, um, for the grandchild, for the Kalers, and um, just ask for protection for that child, that they would uh, come to know you at an early age, and uh, that you would, you would use them in a mighty way for your glory. Uh, bless their parents and their grandparents, and give them wisdom in raising the child. Uh, we thank you for today, uh, just for our place in the community, for the way that you're blessing this church. And uh, just just give us opportunities to uh, to share you and in, in, uh, the craziness that's going on. And, uh, and we pray for our country. Uh, we pray that we would return to our first love and that um, um, you would bless the leaders and uh, that uh, your thoughts would be their thoughts. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we're going to sing a, a few songs that really simply proclaim the fact that God is God is great. He's, he doesn't become great, he is great, and there's never a moment where he's not great. And uh, the first song that we'll sing here is Christ truly is our hope in life and death. Right now, he is our hope. And the opening lyric to this song says, what is our hope in life and death? It's Christ alone. Christ alone. And this is the anchor of our soul. It is the the profession of our truth, it is our confession. It is Christ and him alone. We have that, not in part, but in whole. All those who have repented and believed. So as, as we think about our culture and the things of, of birth, of new grandchildren, and the end of life uh, comes to an end, he is our hope right here, right now. And he is our hope of all eternity. So I encourage you as we sing these songs, you think about the greatness of God. Uh, cast aside your, your concerns or cast your cares down and acknowledge simply who he is, and let's worship him together. So if you would stand with us, and let's sing this together. Is our hope Oh, 
our God intends to dwell again Savior God to thee. 
people said amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 86, so I encourage you to 
grab your Bible and turn there. Psalm 86. It's a prayer of David. And David says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. For I am afflicted and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Make glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and give heed to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I shall call upon you, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will glorify your name forever. For your loving kindness toward me is great, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, arrogant men have risen up against me, and a band of violent men have sought my life, and they have not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Turn to me and be gracious to me. O grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. <clears throat> and as we take time in the worship service, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. So if you would bow your hearts and heads and life with me as we go to the Lord. Father, we thank you that we can sing, Lord, psalms and spiritual songs and hymns that proclaim how great you are. Lord, we realize quickly as we Uh, read your word, we realize that, uh, Father, we lack sufficient words to express how great and mighty and powerful you are. You alone, Lord, are the one that we today, you alone are God, and we lift our souls, Lord, to you. You are, Father, the best that we can express and understand. You are all-powerful. You are almighty. You are merciful and gracious. Lord, we have experienced the the reality that you are slow to anger. You are abundant in loving kindness to all those who come and repent. Lord, you are truth and you never change. Your truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever, for you are true. And just like David, Father, we confess and profess that you alone are God. There is no other. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You do great things and wondrous deeds. There is no one like you. Nothing, Lord, in which to compare you to. And Father, the greatest deed that we experience in this life is Calvary. We thank you for so loving this world that you would send Christ into it, that he would set aside his glory and take on, Lord, humanity, that he would suffer the miseries of this life being born to a poor family, being born under the law, and yet being obedient and fulfilling it and going to the cross. And because of Christ, we, like David, can say you have redeemed our souls from Sheol, from the pit of hell. Oh Lord, we praise you. We thank you. You are good. You are gracious. You are merciful. And Lord, we also know that you are holy. 
and all your ways and all your attributes. And Calvary demonstrates to us and teaches us, Lord, the, the reality of our sin. And we know, Lord, those who have repented and believed on Christ, that we are declared righteous. We have the, the righteousness of Jesus. But Lord, we remain in this body. We struggle against sin, so we take time this morning. God, to confess our sin before you. So, Lord, cleanse us, forgive us for thoughts that, Lord, are contrary to your word. Forgive us for maybe words that have come out of our mouths and deeds we have done. We acknowledge, Father, they are against you. Lord, we pray just like David prayed, prayed cleanse us of our sins. That you would open your ear to our prayers. We ask the Holy Spirit to be active, to be revealing hidden, hidden sins, justified sins, that we might, Lord, according to your Spirit, acknowledge them and repent of them. Lord, we plead that you would open your word to us, that you would teach us, Lord, your ways and direct us in the ways that we should follow after you. Lord, lead us by your Spirit to walk in your truth, that we might be a light that shines in a dark world. Lord, like David, Lord, unite our hearts in fear and reverence of your name. We ask, God, that you would demonstrate your power throughout your church, that you would incline, Lord, your ear and direct us as such. Lord, we are grateful that you have, again, given us your word, that you are true to it, that you change not from it, and that we can know you through it. You desire to be known, Lord, and we realize as we read your word that you are the creator God and you are sovereign. Even now at this time, you are great over everything. So we thank you. We praise you that we know you we can call upon you. It is our desire, Lord, to glorify you and because of Christ that we might do that forever. So Lord, with, with thankfulness, with pleading for your activity, with confession of sin, Lord, we ask now that you would be merciful to us and that you would awaken your church to the power of the gospel. Awaken your church, Lord, to your word. There is, as we can see, Lord, we can discern, there is a spiritual famine in the land. We see this in our culture. We see it in our government, we see it in society, we see it in social media, Lord, and we also see it in your church. So God, we ask you be merciful to us that you would stir the hearts of your pastors, Lord, that you would stir the pulpit, and that today would be a day, Lord, your day, the Lord's day, where your word is opened, and it is read, and it is taught, it is preached, or that your church would be strengthened and encouraged, that we would be edified, that we'd be reminded I pray for us, Lord, at Faith Community Bible Church, that our leadership and our ministries would be focused on your word. Lord, continue to put that burden upon us, that we never look to the right or to the left, but, Lord, solely upon Christ through your word. Let us, God, as we look upon our culture, be a light to shine in a dark world. It is our desire. Lord, if there is going to be a change in our nation, it will come, Lord, beginning in the pulpits of your church with the power of your spirit, that you would ignite your children to stand, to be a voice against what is happening. So we pray for our nation and our states and our community leaders. God, we ask that you be turning their hearts and that we would be a voice, Lord, to the direction in which they should go. We pray over our first responders, those who place their lives in danger for our protection. We ask protection over them. We pray for the lives of our communities. Uh, Lord, for the families of our communities, that there would be strength in it. Lord, again, we would be a voice and an advocate, Lord, for them. We pray against the unrest that we see and the confusion in our culture. Lord, we see many who, who are just angry. We see many who are depressed. We see many who are confused about, uh, Lord, how they are created. <clears throat> so again, we ask, God, that we would be impactful, that we would be reaching out. We pray, Lord, for the body this morning. Those in need of a physical touch, God, we ask that you would make provision for them. Uh, we pray for those who are struggling, Lord, with, with what is happening in our culture, how that trickles in to even a Christian who can lose sight of Christ as we run this race and we can enter into depression. We pray, Lord, make us mindful that you are great and you are always great. 
We pray, Lord, that we would, we would receive testimony of your goodness and your activity, that we would be strengthened in all areas of our lives. We pray for those even this morning, Lord, who just need to be reminded there is hope in you and nowhere else. So God, our prayer, and I pray that we could pray this with complete conviction that, Lord, all those who hate you, Lord, that they might be ashamed. That they would realize, Lord, the greatest need in every soul's life is to be reconciled to their creator. And I pray through your church we would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that they would know how to do that. So, Lord, help us, lead us, comfort us, strengthen us, mature us in you. And, Lord, we also want to take time to pray over the offering this morning that those prepared to give. Lord, our heart, our drive would be to see the gospel preached, to see your kingdom grow here. So, Lord, to that end, let us be cheerful givers. And, uh, Lord, let us glorify you and acknowledge that we are not identified as the world sets identities. Lord, we are not identified by our resources. You call us sons and daughters. We enjoy the spirit of adoption. Father, thank you. So bless the offering. Bless those prepared to give. Lord, we commit all this to you and ask that you would be great. Lord, continue to be great. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to dismiss the children at Children's Church. If they're ready to go, they're more than welcome to head on out. And for us, who are, are just a little bit older, right? The young at heart, of course. We, would you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8? <clears throat> We're going to look at verses 8, 9, and 10. I had planned to, to kind of jump a little bit further through this, but I think there's enough here for us for this morning and uh, definitely Paul is, is hitting on some things that would encourage us and strengthen us. And I just don't want to run through that too quickly. Uh, of course, it's all God's word, but yet I want us to just kind of rest in this wonderful truth as Paul is uh, not just challenging uh, the Corinthian church to give. If you remember the context of, of what is happening, he has received right a, a response from Titus, and there has been an awakening in the church of Corinth, right back to, to loving Paul and excited about Paul being broken uh, with godly sorrow, right? I mean, God can, can work, right? And this is what he's working in the Corinthians. Paul has received Titus' letter, and he goes into this moment of what is happening. It's almost as if he's updating them to the, to the giving that they once began, and because of uh, a falling out between uh, Paul and the church, they, they have not been participating in the collection for those suffering in Jerusalem. And so Paul has this burden. And so he's come to them in chapter 8, and he's reminding them of them. He just doesn't come out and say, hey, look, uh, you guys got back on the right track. Good job. Now, you know, pony up, right? He's not approaching it that way. Uh, and he's very sensitive, and he understands. He sets in the context. It's not about what you give. It's not about who you are in the sense that, that of your resources, but it is about who you are in Christ. Uh, Paul is, is, doesn't set an amount. He says, come and join in the other churches who are going through affliction, who are going through tribulation, who are experiencing poverty, and yet they will not be denied. They have a desire, as he says in verse 4 of this chapter, a favor of participation in the support of the saints. They're not going to be denied. And so Paul is challenging the Corinthians, hey, come along with us and be a part of this. And we begin to see Right, it's a little bit more in these verses we'll look at here in a moment of the humanness. Right, Paul is, is sensitive to this relationship in the church, and, and no doubt it, it can be something that can quickly spiral out of hand in regards to money, right? The giving of money. Um, we see that maybe in our own lives, but he comes with this passage uh, and he sets the right motive once again your heart and who you are in Christ. So he comes to this way of motivation, right? The verses he's going to touch on is, is pointing to Jesus. He's been talking about the Macedonian churches, but he comes with the right motivation. A motivation, we understand motivation, right? I, I know when uh, the, the letter from the DMV shows up and there's a certain time frame to pay for that tag, which, you know, after the, it gives, they give you enough time to complain about the amounts and how it's going up every year. But then they tell you, hey, if you don't pay this in a certain amount of time, right, there's going to be more money owed, right? They're motivated, right, even though you're complaining. 
But motivation, it's just every way. I came across this story, and uh, maybe this pertains to you, I don't know, but there's a story of Bob, I believe his name is uh, Kuchenberg, if I said that right. He played for the Miami Dolphins, and he explained his motivation for going to college. So as he was a child growing up, he said his father and his uncle were human cannonballs in carnivals. A shot out of a cannon, right? And so his father came to him and said, look, son, you either go to college or you become a cannonball. And he goes on, he says, one day, my uncle came out of that cannon, missed the net, and hit the Ferris wheel. He got up and went to college. Now, I assume his, his uncle's okay, right? He shares the story. But that's a, a, an interesting reality, right? I mean, college cannonball. I mean, I don't know if you've ever come across that. I don't know if that's ever been a decision in your life as a motivator. Do I want to be a cannonball or do I want to go to college? Well, you know, here's the reality. You see someone get hurt doing something. Yeah, I'll go do something else, right? Well, Paul has in this passage the drive to motivate us. We've been talking about the grace of God, the grace of giving. I simply called this the motivation for the grace of giving. Uh, that's not enough. But Paul is sensitive to the needs of this church, how they might respond even to a rebuilt relationship in regards to giving. So this is what he says in verses 8, 9, and 10. He says, I, I am not speaking this as a command. If you remember, he ended Verse 7, is that you would abound in, in this gracious work. And then he says, I am not speaking, again in verse 8, this is a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others, the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And then he says in verse 10, I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage. Who were the first to begin a year ago, not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. Now from there, Paul is going to go into finishing the task, right? But here he sets this, this tone for us. Consider Christ consider what he has done. So let me offer a brief prayer as we look at this passage. Father, we, we once again want to call upon your great name and ask, Lord, that your word would come alive, Lord, for us. Um, that today would not be a day of simply growing and gaining knowledge or understanding, but that we would grow in holiness, we'd grow in confidence, and that we'd have a right thinking regarding, Lord, to your, your blessings in our lives. And that we are not controlled or to be controlled by our resources, but to see them as your goodness, your blessings, not only to us, but also as a means to help others. So Lord, let our heart be right before you. And let this, this passage come alive. Let the Spirit teach us and instruct us in this area. And Lord, get me out of the way that that would be what we have this morning, what you desire for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I, <clears throat> I've mentioned a few times, right, we've been talking through this passage, and Paul is going to be addressing this throughout chapter 8, but there is this element of, of Christianity in regards to giving, right? There is this solidarity, there is this coming together, there is this moment of understanding that we have been given much, and so we are, are we're ready and willing to do what we can to help others. That doesn't seem too far out of left field, we understand that. And so addressing these things and being sensitive to the Corinthians, Paul has, beginning back in verse 1, he said, hey, be mindful of the activity of God's grace, right? And trust it, as it goes in the first couple of verses, right? He is at work, let us trust this. And then last Sunday, we talked about how grace empowers us, how it propels us, how it orients us, right? We, we think differently. Uh, you know, sometimes that's an insult. They think a little different, but Christians, we think differently. That's a good thing, right? We think contrary to the world, we have different priorities, different reasons for our resources, right? And then he ends in, in 6 and 7, this challenge. And it's interesting that Paul does write this as a command. He is commanding them, at the end of verse 7, that you would abound in this gracious work. But then he turns right around and softens it as he says, right, I do not write this as a command. 
right? You can see re- re- just responding to their relationship. You can imagine that even though there's been reconciliation and godly sorrow, according to the will of God, there might be that one person who goes, see, I told you so. He's just about the money, right? And that little seed of doubt could float through the church. And so Paul is not going to let that happen. He has spent time, right, up until this point to say, look, uh, the affliction and the poverty of these churches in Macedonia. Look what they are doing. Look how they will not be denied. Look at the grace and the activity of God in their lives. And then he comes to this passage and he says, let this grace abound. But, but then he turns and says, look at Christ. Right? Look at Christ. Paul is not, again, he's not concerned about the amount. We don't see anywhere where he says, hey, uh, the Smiths here in this passage need to step it up. He's not calling people out. He's not calling amounts out. He's calling the church to be a part of this. So in essence, he's speaking, right, to all the Corinthians, of course, and he's speaking what? If you profess Christ, he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. The passage is not, again, it's not about uh, the normal Lord's Day giving. It's about a special need above and beyond. So this is what Paul is addressing. So he comes to this. In this relationship, writing to this church, he gives us a few little points of motivation this is what I'm saying in verse, in verse 8. We say, my point is, we are motivated through the love for Christ. Right? As he's beginning to turn a little bit from what's happening in the churches of, of Macedonia, as it's 6 and 7, he turns back to, hey, Corinthians, be a part of this. And then he's beginning to continue to address, right? You too have this love. He says, I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity, right? The validation, the, the solidarity, the, the working together. You're, you're really on the same page with us. You're going to demonstrate this love also because you too love Christ. So Paul does not want to be misunderstood here. Right? Isn't it easy to, to, if you think about giving or somebody asking for money, it's unfortunate today and for the abuses that we see, unfortunately, in the church uh, how people ask and demand and guilt you in and use all these gimmicks that you give and God won't bless you unless you, you know, you give, give a little bit more. I remember um, re- hearing of Reinhard Bunke. I got an opportunity to hear him preach one time. He was a missionary to, um, I believe it was India. And I, would, you know, I was just so excited to hear Reinhard. He preached and then he sat down and the person who did his representation, who gave the, the call for the offering to support the ministry, made a statement that said, for every dollar you give, a soul goes into heaven, right? Now that is guilting every single soul in the building, right? Who would not deplete all the resources to see every doll if it went to a soul that would spend eternity in heaven? Well, we can't make that guarantee, right? So we see these things. So Paul is not going to be misunderstood, right? He has, he has stressed the grace of of Jesus Christ, the love they have. He's written that in a commandment. Then he turns around and says, I'm not writing a command to you, but I'm asking you that you would prove your sincerity. Right? Put, put action to your words. That's simply what he's saying. And, and if Christ, our love for Christ, can't motivate us, then there's something wrong, right? It, it's natural, a natural response of a Christian who has received, who's come to Calvary and received what Christ has done. A natural response is what? How can I help? Right? We prove, we prove our love by how we live, by what we do, how we treat our resources every area. And we understand this, right? I mean, in your own life, this, this is very common, right? If you had a spouse or a child, or a parent, or a grandparent, and that was in need, you would not hesitate to share your time, right? Your resources, your possessions, whatever you needed to do to make uh, this situation right. How can I help? And we automatically do that in family. I mean, that's what John was sitting at in 1 John three sixteen. This is how we know what love is. You want love defined? Look at Jesus. He laid down his life. And John says, you should lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. You too should give your life. And then he, he makes it very practical, right? He turns and says, look, if you see your brother in need, which means relationship, we know other people, but if you see him in need and do nothing, how is the love of God in you? Right? So he just goes right to the point, just so we're not missing it. He's saying, look, if we hold on to these things and you see a brother in need, how is God at work in you? Because Jesus, what? He laid down his life. 
So in the church, we, we should not be hesitant, but yet the struggle is real. We see the, the, the mismanagement of funds, unfortunately. We see uh, throughout what happens on televangelists and, and the gimmicks and things. So there is a hesitation. And in going back into our text here, we know that there, there could be someone that Paul is, is, as he's writing this, who might misunderstand his words and just simply go, I knew it. I knew it. He's not going to take that to Jerusalem. He's not taking that money. I knew it. Right? And we see the reasons for what's happening in the other churches. We see, right, this is what's going on. This is how they're participating. He's being very delicate in approaching the, the ask for money. So it gives us some, some insight into the relationship, right? But in, and instead of Paul coming and saying, look, right, I'm an apostle. Here's the deal, right? Here's what you need to do. Here's the amount. Let's get it done. He's not doing that. He's not issuing a decree, right? He comes and says, look, your knowledge, your loyalty, your love for Christ is all that's necessary. It should propel you. It's as if Christ, or excuse me, as Paul is coming to this church as an ambassador of the king, right? He's on behalf of the king. He comes before a group of people. He knows they're loyal. He knows they have the means. And, and the people know that the king is gracious and he's merciful. And that the ambassador doesn't have to say, hey, let's do it for the king. He's asking a favor. He doesn't come and force this. He just simply knows, hey, they, all, they, they too love Jesus. I mean, it, we wouldn't stand in the palace, right, of a king and him request something of us and us stand there shaking our heads no right that's that's kind of the picture he gives us we understand that jesus is the king of kings paul has a burden from the king of kings he's not coming as a command he's simply saying look there are those really suffering and your love for christ again should motivate us and if we've come to calvary then it's not a a problem to be eager to share right to to be willing to, to give, to ask the question, how can I help? Right, because we too know the king. But Paul is very sensitive, isn't he? He expects that answer. He doesn't expect them to shake their heads or no, anything like that. There's no gimmicks attached to this. There's no, uh, hey, this is going here. No, this is a real need. And your love for Christ should propel you. See, for Paul, we see this in him, right? He never treats the gospel as his opinion. He never treats scripture, especially for him, the Old Testament, as simply a suggestion. He doesn't come and say, you know what, let me guilt you into this by talking about uh, the preeminence of Christ and what he has come uh, to, to this earth and what he's gone through just so I can manipulate you. Unfortunately, we might see that today, but this is far from Paul's heart. His heart actually is, come be a part of this. We'll see that in verse 10. You began, right? Continue. Don't let, right, the Corinthians, don't let your church become just simply a byword. Come and show solidarity, right? Your love for Christ, prove it out. Show your sincerity. You know, I think this is this is something we can grab hold of. It's very tangible. It's very easy to say, hey, my love for Christ, when I see a need, no problem, pastor. We can move on to the next point. But in reality, right, there's often this word that, that creates a hiccup for us, and that word is unless. Yes, I will give, I will do this unless. And that might be a valid unless, right? There might be reasons for that, but sometimes we look for that unless quite quickly, don't we? It's like the story of this young man who was just captivated by this girl he was dating, and he's, and he's looking into her eyes, and he says, I'm, I love you. I'm never going to stop loving you. I will go to the ends of the earth just, just so I could love you. I'm going to be there through, through fire, right, through, through waves, through floods. It's not going to quench my love for you. And he ended that sentence by saying, I'll see you tomorrow unless it rains. Floods, no problem. Rain, nah, hesitate. See, that's what we do sometimes, isn't it? Hey, I'll be there, Pastor, no problem. I'll do this. Hey, Christ, yes, I love him. I got this unless. So Paul is being sensitive to that unless. Paul is being sensitive to that need and saying, come, come, out, come on, right? Corinthians, don't let this, this money give you a hiccup. Come back and say, 
hey, man, my love for Christ, it is the right motivator. I know what suffering is. I know what poverty is. I've experienced that, right? So we come. That's what Paul is saying. Come. There's a real need. So that's the great motivation. So to take that now, he begins to expand this. Right as he goes into verse 9, it's our, I simply say we're motivated through the example of Christ. Not just our love for him, but the example of him. I mean, it's not enough for Paul simply to say, hey, you too are in this. You have a love for the church. You have a love for Christ. You have a love for us. We've established our relationship. So get in this. But he goes, now let me take this a little bit further. Let me, let me focus in, if you will, on what exactly this, this Savior has done. Let's listen to these words, verse 9. For you know... Right? Writing to the Corinthians, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. It's easy to just read these words and just go on, yeah, amen, right? But listen to what he says, right? I mean, the, the, the greatest reason for your giving is Calvary. I mean, what else could God do that's greater than this? You know, we might go through hardships here. We might go without. We might look at others who might have more than us. But I'm telling you, brother and sister, right, friend, that there is nothing greater than being reconciled to God through Christ. And we have them not just now, but we have them eternally. So here's the example, right? I mean, we ask that question and how has is, how is God demonstrated? How has God loved me? Well, he is a God who doesn't sit around and wait for us to figure it out, does he? He still loves the world that he gives. He gave his only son. His son comes, right? The preexistent Christ comes and suffers the miseries of this life for your sake and mine. See, we understand the reality, right? When someone says something and they don't follow through, we think, well, that's just, you know, that's a normal thing. But when somebody follows through and lives it by example, what a greater impact, isn't it? I mean, Spurgeon had a great quote here. He says, a man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds, right, his actions as dollars and his words as pennies. If his life and doctrine disagree, the mass of onlooker, onlookers accept his practice and reject his preaching. Right? We understand example. We understand that, hey, you know, God isn't going to leave us to ourselves. He is acting. And so now uh, Paul realizing these things, he's looked at the Macedonian churches, and so he's, he's talked about, hey, there's this love. This love is rooted in Christ. Now let me tell you and remind you that you too know him. That's how he begins that verse. You know, for you know. You understand, right? You've personally experienced you have come to Calvary. You have believed when Paul planted the church and he preached the gospel. They have come to understand that, yeah, we live in this world and the world looks upon the, Christ, or upon the cross of Christ as foolishness, but yet we have come to know that it is the wisdom and the power of God. This is what we know. The Corinthians struggled with that, didn't they? We want something else. We want to look like the world. Paul to address all those things. But I wrote, there's three things here that I believe Paul just reminds them of. What do they know? What do you know as a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, one, you should know about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You should have some knowledge, right, about the grace. I mean, you should know yourself and come to Calvary and realize he did this for me. We know something about God's provision, right? Grace includes, as he attaches grace to the Lord, right? Jesus Christ. Well, then grace includes, of course, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It includes Jesus' death, his resurrection. It includes his substitutionary atoning work on the cross. It includes words like justification, adoption, and sanctification. It includes the idea of peace with God and the remission of sin, right? The, the redemption uh, that he brought about. It includes, right, the ongoing activity of God's presence. Again, man's greatest needs, God's greatest answer is Calvary. So if you, if you know Christ this way, then you have experienced 
God's grace. So Paul is writing, right, to the believers. He's writing to you. He's writing to us who can rely, who stand upon, and where our assurance of faith, right, our confidence, our blessed assurance is in the fact that Christ is our Redeemer. Christ is our brother. Christ is our friend. He's our mediator, our intercessor, our advocate with the Father, and he himself is our propitiation for sins. This, right, is our confidence. Paul has told them in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 30, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And Paul says the personal pronoun are. He himself is included in this. He's included with the Corinthians, and he includes himself with you if this is your profession today. This is who he is. This is what they know. They know what Christ accomplished. Paul goes on and says, this grace, right? And he, he expands it, if you will, explaining a little bit more. This is why I can be confident in what he's saying. In the second part of verse 9, he says that it's grace that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. So how did Jesus accomplish it? Well, he had to come. He had to be born here. He had to live the sinless life. And in this verse, these words right here, take us right back to chapter 5, verse 21, where we see him say, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right, Paul, in essence, is saying the same thing, yet that he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2, just so you, you would hear these words and see these words. I encourage you to put your, your finger on these words. We'll just begin Philippians chapter 2, verse uh, five, he says, have this attitude. He's talking about the mindset of Christ, right? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? And, and who was Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So what did Jesus do? He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So how did Jesus become poor? He emptied himself to the points of being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Who did he do this for? You, your sake. See, Paul is talking about the preexistence of of Christ. Before Christ came, he was in his glory. Remember uh, Jesus' priestly prayer where Jesus prays in John 17, 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus saying, look, here's the glory I had. Glorify me now. Paul is saying, this is the glory that Jesus set aside. He was rich. He was everything. And yet for your sake, he takes on humanity. He comes and as, as a man born into a poor family, experiencing, again, the sufferings of this life. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is God, a very God. And yet he comes. It's in these words, the richness to his poverty. God took on humanity. He becomes the God-man. Right? Jesus took on flesh and blood. The Almighty God took the place of the lowest. The sovereign Lord became the subject. The beloved became rejected. The perfect one became the sacrifice for sin. The life, right? The life of Christ. He himself became the substitute for death. This is what they know. Why did Jesus do this? Your sake. You. Me. You think for a moment, if you ever have that thought that the gospel is not for you, quickly repent of that thought. 
Paul is writing, right, to the Corinthians and all their struggles and all their insecurities coming out from a pagan culture, relearning and rethinking, redoing this, and the reconciliation that has happened. What does Paul say? Hey, the gospel's taken root. You know this. It speaks, right, to the power of what God can do. It speaks to the depravity of man. Paul is saying right here that Jesus, his love, his grace, it reaches down to every lost soul. They know that Jesus reaches the tax collector and sinners. They know it reaches that Jesus' gospel, his word, reaches to prostitutes and those who are sexually immoral. It reaches to those who are rich or poor, strong, and weak, rejected, and ashamed. Those who experience and are experiencing guilt and hopelessness. The gospel is for you. So Jesus is willing to go to the gutter, isn't he? This is what they know. If you are saved, I would believe you would agree with me that, that I am the one he had to go down to the gutter to get. And Paul says this, he left his pre-existent state, his glory. He set it aside. He has come. Look at the contrast. Look at how Paul paints this contrast. It's the riches of Christ, right, before he came, the glory of Christ, and with the poverty of human existence during his earthly life. And he places us right in the middle of that. This is for you. Right, the leaving of the holiness and the glory of heaven to enter the profanity and the poverty of earth. Here in a few months, as Jack hinted at the quickness of time, right? We're coming to the end of September. Here in a few months, we will sing these words. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Jesus came, born of a virgin. Why? Your sake. So this is what we must understand the gospel. Understand the links and the, the breath and what God will go through to, to reconcile and to redeem and to remind and to teach. You know, he's telling us, Jesus, for your sake, Corinthians, Faith Community Bible Church, Christ became poor for us. He took on humanity for you. And the question quickly responds as Paul's writing in this passage, hey, why don't you join with us, right? Is there any hesitation at the end of that? You see the passion of Paul. Hopefully you're still in, in uh, uh, Philippians. If you would look at verse 3, and we'll look at verses 7 and 8, and I pray that this would be your, your confession. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them rubbish, that I might gain Christ. Verse 9, being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Look at verse 10, that I, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. There's Paul's heart. There is the heart of every believer who has come to Calvary. It says this, right? This is what Christ did. Here's what he accomplished. Here's how he accomplished it. And that rolls us right into why, right? We've touched on it. You and I are the why. He says in the last part of verse 9, so that you through his poverty might become rich. You're it. Today on earth, breathing and living, every uh, Christian, every person who professes Christ, you're it. You're the why. Now, we can attach, of course, all throughout, all, all throughout history, those who have believed and have gone on to glory, but yet, when I was talking about those living, you're it. You're the voice. You're the life. You're the hands. You're the feet. You're the ambassador. You're it. We love to sing the songs, right, of victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. 
We proclaim, right, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. We sing it out that he loved me ere I knew him, but all my love, right, is due him. He's the one who plunged me to victory. Cleansing flood, you're it. Paul has touched on, going back to chapter 6 in in, uh, 2 Corinthians, listen to what he says, the, the, the commands, therefore, chapter 6, verse 17, therefore, come out, from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You're it. You become sons and daughters to the king. Paul says the same things in Romans uh, chapter 8. Turn a few verses over there, if you would. Romans 8. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. 15 through 17. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. You are the why. This is a factual reality. Paul places all this in the context of giving. So the question we must ask ourselves, are you willing? Are, are you understanding that you are the why? Is it, is it affecting your thinking? Is it affecting the way you treat every area of your life? And of course, in context, our giving. I love the story about David Livingston. Uh, he was a missionary. The Missionary Society reached out to him and they asked him, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. And he responds by saying, if you have men who will come only if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. What is he saying? I I want people who understand they're the why, and there's nothing that's going to stop us. We serve Christ. We go with Christ. We are to be becoming rich in Christ and understanding what that means as we live our lives. And we're not waiting, right, for a good road. We're, we're going forward. This is what Christ has done. This is what Paul is drawing their attention to. So I ask you, has he not accomplished this in you? Are you outside of his gaze? Have you come to Calvary and thought, maybe this isn't for me? And I would challenge you, friend, repent, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to know him. Paul sets all of this in the context of giving. Let it change your life. Let it realize, yeah, the Lord knows. He knows you need clothing and shelter and a car to get to work. But he blesses you, not just for you. Is it wrong to have material things? No. Those things must not be our God. Christ has come. And when we treat other things as more important than Jesus, we have failed to understand that we are the why. This is Paul's motivation to the church. We see this, right? It's your love for Christ. Yes. It's an example of Christ. Yeah, we know him. We see it in him. We realize it's for our sakes. And my last point this morning is verse 10. We are motivated through the purpose of Christ, right? Here's, here's the drive. Paul kind of focuses in on the church, and now he's beginning to focus out on, on the bigger need, right? The purpose of the church. We know, right, from, from the Great Commission what our job is. Make disciples, right? Teach all that the Lord has commanded in the process of doing those things, man, we help and serve and build one another. We strengthen the church. And so Paul has, again, right, as he comes back to this element of, of simply saying, hey, I, I, I want to be gracious in this. I, I give my opinion in this matter, right? It's not a command. I give you my opinion. But then he turns around and says, 
but this is for your advantage, right? It's an opinion, but you would be wise to understand this. And he says, but then he tells them, right? You, you were the first to begin a year ago. You were, you were on this already. This was your heart, and then we had this relational hiccup that's been reconciled. But he says he even speaks it was also your desire. This is their desire, right? The church, the principle of giving. That it, I, I want to be willing. Paul doesn't call on one family, one person. He calls upon the church to give what they feel is right, what they can do. That's what he's saying. So Paul says, man, this is, this is who you were. This is even the character in which you were. You desired this, right? It was your heartbeat. And then in verse 11, he's going to start, he's going to start driving the idea of finish it, right? But here he's simply saying this was your desire. And I, I think just by way of warning us, sometimes we, we can get complicit, right? We can think I gave once or, or our, my, some type of my past performance you know, has, has set me right for today, and, and we fail to understand that, that you know, it's, it's in the moment, right? It's the living right now. It's what can you do right now, not what have I done once. Paul brings him back to that. Hey, we started it. You had a desire for it. Let's, let's finish this. And I think through life, sometimes we, we struggle with living this out and just being in a practical sense. So Paul presses them forward, and he says, hey, this is a worthy cause. It's a, it's a missional cause. You started this cause. It was the right thing. You had the right motive, the right heart, the right desire. Let's see it come to fruition. Join in. Rooted in Christ. It's, it's amazing. You know, we have not a whole lot of things to say about the Corinthians by way of good things. Lately, we have been saying some very good things. And even here, Paul is referencing some more good things. So the question for us is simply, what, is, what has kept us? What, is, what has stopped us? Paul's not laying a burden upon their shoulders to say, it's all on you again. It's, it's a collection of churches meeting the need. And for us, it's simply to come back to say, hey, we must be motivated through the love, our love for Christ. We must consider his example. What did he accomplish? Man, he set his glory is signed. How did he do it? He went to Calvary. Why did he do this? For us? What a sweet mystery. So therefore, as Paul begins, because of that, because of Christ, he sets us in motion. Here's the purpose. Here's where we're going. So we can be motivated a lot of different ways, can't we? Some of us may never experience right, college or cannonball. But man, if we've come to Calvary, what other motivation do you need? Here we're in a moment, we're, I'm going to pray, but we're going to close with, with a great hymn, Be Thou My Vision. And I, I want to set this challenge in front of you, that you not just simply sing these words, but it would be your confession. You would confess just like verse 3 says, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. This needs to be us. There are moments and opportunities all around us. We'll open our eyes, be motivated by the gospel, by this wonderful truth that the preexistent Christ laid his glory aside made us the why. Redeemed us that we might be the hands and feet of Christ. That his kingdom might go forward, that his gospel would be preached. What a great honor, what a great privilege. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the truth again as we've opened your word today, and I ask that you would um, let it grow in us, that the evil one would not come and steal these seeds, but Lord, that we would grow in holiness, we would grow in maturity, we would grow in the, especially an understanding of giving, of understanding our resources, and most importantly, Lord, that we would understand the gospel, that we'd understand, uh, Lord, the depths at which Jesus has gone to redeem us. And Lord, we think about uh, those who Paul writes in the Corinthian church, such were some of you, 
we, we feel that in us. That's for some of us. And the gospel is powerful enough to redeem. Lord, we live in a culture today that wants to say uh, there is no objective truth. And because of that, we have people who think they can be uh, identify a thousand different ways. But Lord, as we, we realize that that is such a damaging understanding, it's a trajectory that leads to hell because it is a denial, Lord, of your truth. And so I pray that the gospel would come alive to us, that we would be a light to shine, and that in our own lives we would demonstrate, Lord, to our brothers and sisters and those in need, God, if we have a, a means, a way, that we might be active, that we might consider what Christ has done, that we might be motivated because we do. We love, we love him because he first loved us. We love his church. We, we Lord, uh, look upon every soul as valuable, so made in the image of God because you are the creator. And so, Lord, we want to be used by you to help other people see, to come to Calvary. Because, as Paul has told this church, there is a day when every single one of us will stand before you. So, God, open our eyes. Let us, let us realize that reality and let us today live as people who understand why, that we are the why for our sake. So let us be the hands and feet of Christ. Let us not look to the left or the right. Let us stand for truth with boldness and confidence. Even in moments where we know not what to do, let us stand and know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And God, so use the resources. Lord, use the resources that you've blessed us with that we might strengthen others, encourage one another, and see, Lord, your kingdom grow. That is what we pray. And so, Father, be, be now, be our vision, and direct us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before we sing the, the closing song this morning, if you have questions regarding the sermon or um, uh, questions, theological questions, or questions what it means to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior, please come talk to me. Set up a time, let's meet, let's, let's work through those questions. I'd love to do that for you. Uh, if you need prayer, I'll be up here. I'd love to pray with you and encourage you any way that I can. But as we sing, I just want to encourage you once again, or, or make you mindful that sing this as, as a desire, as a, as a confession, as a promise. Uh, plead, right, as a pleading, Lord, be this in me. But let's stand together one more time. Let's close our service by singing, Be Thou My Vision.